Hello and welcome to episode 9 of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode 8 by learning about four new topics. These include the anatomy of the respiratory system, the mechanisms of respiration, lung volume and capacity, and finally gaseous exchange. So firstly, what is the respiratory system? The respiratory system is responsible for pulmonary ventilation or breathing and brings inhaled air into contact with blood so that oxygen could be absorbed and carbon dioxide removed. It consists of structures from the nose and mouth all the way down to the alveoli, which are tiny structures in the lungs where gases are exchanged. The respiratory system can perform other functions as well as gaseous exchange. The act of exhaling air also removes some water and heat from the body. The water can be seen when we exhale air on a cold day. The respiratory system has to filter, warm and moisten air as it goes from a cold, dirty, dry external environment into a warm, clean, moist internal environment. The respiratory system also provides us with a sense of smell and allows us to produce sounds and noise. Let's now move on to the anatomy of the respiratory system. There are three major parts of the respiratory system, the airway, the lungs and the muscles of respiration. The airway, which includes the nose, mouth, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi and bronchioles, carries air between the lungs and the body's exterior. The lungs act as functional units of the respiratory system by passing oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide out of the body. Finally, the muscles of respiration, including the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, work together and act as a pump by pushing air in and out of the lungs during breathing. So let's look at these individual parts of the respiratory system in more detail. Nose and mouth. Air enters the respiratory system through the nose or the mouth. If it goes in the nostrils, the air is warmed and humidified. Cilia, which are tiny hairs, protect the nasal passageways and other parts of the respiratory tract, filtering out dust and other particles that may enter the nose through breathed air. Pharynx. The nasal cavity and the mouth openings meet at the pharynx at the back of the nose and mouth. The pharynx is part of the digestive system as well as the respiratory system because it carries both food and air. At the bottom of the pharynx, this pathway divides into two, the esophagus which leads to the stomach and the other for air. The epiglottis, a small flap of tissue, covers the air-only passage when we swallow, keeping food and liquid from going into the lungs. The larynx also known as your voice box, is located at the top of the trachea. This short tube contains a pair of vocal cords which vibrate to make sounds. Trachea. The walls of the trachea are strengthened by stiff rings of cartilage to keep it open. The trachea is also lined with cilia, which sweeps fluid and foreign particles out of the airway so they stay out of the lungs. Bronchus. This is where the trachea meets the lungs. It divides into the left primary bronchus, and the right primary bronchus. These bronchi deliver air into the lungs and are also made from firm C-shaped rings of cartilage. These primary bronchi quickly subdivide into secondary bronchi that lead to different lobes within each lung. The right lung being slightly larger has three lobes, whilst the left lung has two. Bronchioles. In the lungs, bronchi subdivide 23 times to make up around 8 million terminal bronchioles in each lung. Bronchioles are smaller versions of bronchi. As they subdivide, they become smaller and smaller, with some bronchi measuring less than 1 mm in diameter. The bronchi and bronchioles resemble a tree where the trunk divides into smaller and smaller branches. As a result, the lungs are often referred to as the bronchial tree. The walls of the bronchi are made up of cartilage and smooth muscle, but as their branches become increasingly smaller, the cartilage disappears and they consist predominantly of smooth muscle. This smooth muscle can contract to help push air along the airways. Alveoli. Bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli, where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place. Each person has hundreds of millions of alveoli in their lungs. Each alveolus is surrounded by a network of tiny capillaries where oxygen enters the blood from the alveoli and carbon dioxide is transferred to the alveoli from blood. Finally, we have the lungs. The lungs themselves are positioned within the rib cage and are closed off at the top by the clavicle and the muscle around it. At the bottom of the chest, they are sealed by the diaphragm 
which is a large sheet of muscle that covers the bottom of the rib cage. The lungs are enclosed by the pleural membrane, which is also present at the back of the ribs. The two surfaces of the pleural membrane are connected by pleural fluid, which is present in the pleural space. The lungs stick to the back of the ribs rather than being in a fixed position. This is one of the reasons why the lungs can collapse if they are punctured. If this is the case, the lungs need to be inflated again to allow them to reattach to the back of the ribs. The movement of the ribs is one of the mechanisms of respiration or breathing. Now we've covered some of the basic anatomy of the respiratory system, let's now look into the mechanisms of respiration. Respiration is more complex than it may initially seem. Breathing of course consists of two processes, inspiration and expiration. Let's start with inspiration, which takes place when the volume of the thoracic cavity is increased and the air pressure is decreased. Simultaneous contraction of the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm expands the thorax. As the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract, lung volume increases. Inspiration involves the following events. First of all, external intercostal muscles contract and internal intercostal muscles relax. Due to the contraction of the external intercostal muscles, the ribs are pulled upward, resulting in an increase in thoracic cavity size. The thoracic cavity further enlarges due to the contraction of the diaphragm. This lowers the diaphragm and increases the total size of the thoracic cavity. With an increase in size of the thorax, the lungs expand simultaneously. As the lungs expand, the air pressure inside is reduced, therefore equalizing the pressure. Atmospheric air rushes inside the lungs. Expiration takes place when the size of the thoracic cavity is reduced and air pressure is increased. The internal intercostal muscles contract and the external intercostal muscles relax. Due to the contraction of the internal intercostal muscle, ribs are pulled inwards resulting in a decrease in size of the thoracic cavity. Furthermore, the diaphragm is pushed upward due to its relaxation. With the decrease in size of the thoracic cavity, the lungs are compressed. When the lungs are compressed, pressure increases so the air is forced outside. The intercostal muscles are responsible for chest breathing along with other skeletal muscles which become active when breathing deepens. The pectoralis minor, sternocleidomastoid and scalene muscles act to elevate the ribs and sternum. At rest and at low levels of activity, the contraction of the diaphragm is responsible for 75% of air inhaled. However, the action of the diaphragm can be impeded if a person is pregnant, obese or has eaten a heavy meal. This can cause shortness of breath and laboured chest breathing. At intense levels of exercise, the body's need for air is met by the action of the external intercostal muscles and associated muscles that move the ribs. At rest, exhalation is a passive process, meaning that skeletal muscle contractions are not required. Exhalation only becomes an active process when breathing becomes forceful, such as running quickly or blowing up a balloon. Forceful exhalation is the responsibility of the internal intercostal muscles, assisted by other skeletal muscles such as the obliques, transverse abdominis and rectus abdominis. They act to force the ribs down and, in conjunction with the diaphragm relaxing and moving upwards, the space in the lungs decreases, forcing air out. To recap, the diaphragm is responsible for increasing the volume of the rib cage and produces stomach breathing. The intercostals are responsible for moving the rib cage upwards and outwards and are responsible for chest breathing. Now let's move on to lung volume and capacity. When learning about this topic, it's really important to get to grips with some key terms and what they mean. Total lung capacity refers to the volume of air in the lungs after maximum inhalation. Tidal volume is the volume of air in each breath. Residual volume is the volume of air left in the lungs after full exhalation. Vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled and exhaled in one breath. Inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that can be inhaled in addition to tidal volume. Expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air that can be exhaled in addition to tidal volume. Functional residual capacity is the potential amount of air that can be exhaled. And finally, inspiratory capacity is the additional volume of air that can be exhaled without using any residual capacity.
The maximum amount of air our lungs can hold is approximately 5 litres. This is approximately equivalent to the amount of air in a basketball. We are only able to expel a maximum of 4 litres of air or else the lungs would collapse. The residual 1 litre of air is called the residual volume. The amount of air we can inhale with each breath is referred to as the tidal volume. At rest, we have a tidal volume of around 0.5 litres of air with each breath. On average, humans take between 10 to 12 breaths per minute. This means that we pass between 5 to 6 litres of air per minute through our lungs. The volume of air that's breathed per minute is referred to as minute ventilation. During exercise, the amount of air we breathe in and out and the number of breaths we take increase significantly. The maximum volume of air that can be inhaled and exhaled is the vital capacity, and as exercise intensity increases, the tidal volume becomes larger and can increase until vital capacity is reached. Breathing rate can also increase significantly as well, rising to 30 to 50 breaths per minute, depending on the intensity of exercise. If tidal volume were to increase to 4 litres per breath, and breathing rate to 50 breaths per minute, then the volume of air passing through the lungs per minute, known as minute ventilation, is increased to 200 litres per minute. This is a significant increase on the minute volume of 5 litres at rest. Lung function can adapt with exercise, but an individual's capacity is limited by the size of the individual's ribcage. Because this cannot increase, the size of the lungs cannot increase. However, the respiratory muscles will act like any other skeletal muscles that adapt to exercise by becoming larger and stronger. Thus, the lungs can become more efficient and move more air in and out with each breath. The last topic we are going to cover in this episode is gaseous exchange. The cells in our body need oxygen to stay alive and carbon dioxide is made in our bodies as cells do their jobs. The lungs and respiratory system allow oxygen in the air to be taken into the body while also letting the body get rid of carbon dioxide in the air we breathe out. Every few seconds, with each inhalation, air fills a large portion of the millions of alveoli in our bodies. In a process called diffusion, oxygen moves from the alveoli to the blood through capillaries lining the alveolar walls. Once in the bloodstream, oxygen gets picked up by the haemoglobin in red blood cells. This oxygen-rich blood then flows back to the heart, which it pumps through the arteries to oxygen-hungry tissues throughout the body. In the tiny capillaries of the body's tissues, oxygen is freed from the haemoglobin and moves into the cells. Carbon dioxide, made by the cells as they do their work, moves out of the cells into the capillaries, where most of it dissolves in the plasma of the blood. Blood rich in carbon dioxide then returns back to the heart via the veins. From the heart, this blood is pumped to the lungs where carbon dioxide passes into the alveoli to be exhaled. Did you know that roughly 78% of the air you breathe in is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, 0.03% carbon dioxide and 0.9% other gases? whilst the air you breathe out is 78% nitrogen, 17% oxygen, 4% carbon dioxide, and 0.9% other gases. The term diffusion simply means the movement of a gas from an area of higher partial pressure to an area of lower partial pressure. All gases move by diffusion. For example, if someone was to spray perfume or aftershave on their body, It will be smelt by other people in the room because it diffuses from an area where its partial pressure is high, the location that has been sprayed, to an area of partial pressure that's lower, which is the rest of the room in this example. In the body, oxygen and carbon dioxide change places by diffusing from areas of higher partial pressure to low partial pressure. Diffusion takes place in two areas of the body. It occurs in the lungs to introduce oxygen into the bloodstream and it occurs in muscles and other tissues where oxygen moves out of the bloodstream and carbon dioxide moves into it. In the muscles and tissues, oxygen is used to produce energy. The diffusion of gases in the lungs is often referred to as external respiration, while the diffusion in other tissues, such as muscles, is referred to as internal respiration. That concludes the ninth episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content.
You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant, and I'll see you in the next episode where we begin study on the cardiovascular system.